so um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here uh, to a career night. Um, I'm uh, Nate Rosenstein. I'm uh, the chair of the history department um, and a soon-to-be former uh, professor here at Ohio State. So anything I say, um, you know, take with a grain of salt. Um, before we get started, uh, there are two people who are key to um, your success in this program uh, who uh, are not on the faculty, uh, who are members of our staff, and that is uh, Ray Irwin and Maria Mazan, who are um, outstanding uh, staff members um, who do a heroic work at uh, advising you all, uh, and who, in addition to that, put together a career night. Uh, it is really a very uh, valuable and very special um, thing that they do, uh, really above and beyond the call of duty. They're not here uh, for you to embarrass them with your applause, but at the end, we will try to uh, get them both to blush uh, significantly. Um, a, it's uh, a great opportunity on uh, career night for you to find out just what you can do uh, with degree in history. Um, I will tell you that my wife has a degree in history. She went to law school. She now uh, is the director for uh, health care for the state, uh, the school employees uh, retirement system. And she says that she uh, prefers to hire liberal arts majors because they can do two things that engineers cannot do, which is write and think. <laughs> um, so, um, and that the uh, liberal arts majors uh, wind up in the C-suite. Uh, they wind up uh, at the top, the engineers are still grinding away uh, with their slide rules uh, and, uh, and, uh, pen and uh, uh, lead pencils. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let me um, uh, introduce the first speaker, which is uh, Hal Tedroff, one of our more recent graduates uh, from the department. He graduated in uh, May of last year with BA and took a position with a, as, uh, with the Wendy's Corporation. He tells me he has nothing to do uh, with French fries or, or hamburgers, but he is in fact a development specialist. Uh, and I will let Hal tell you more about uh, what he uh, does. So please uh, join me in, in welcoming Hal. Uh, well, I'm Hal, and I work for the Wendy's Company. And uh, I've been there for a couple of years now. I'm a development specialist, and in the most vague sense that pretty much means I'm a project manager for uh, development of new restaurants. And that is on the company and the franchise side, uh, all the way from, hey, we're investigating this site, we want to take a look at it, to getting it open. Um, so I track and manage uh, pretty much the entire process from start to finish. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of skills that I learned as a history major that proved very useful in the business field. And hopefully, uh, you guys are all learning those exact same skills as well. Um, so what's kind of interesting in, in my team, there are six of us who work in the West Territory developing restaurants, and three of us have an undergrad of history, uh, my boss and then one of the other directors. So the skills that we learned as undergrads uh, in history have really translated very well into the business world. I think the number one skill that I use every day that I honed as a history major uh, would be communication. The ability to transfer uh, knowledge and data and information to a bunch of people. Uh, and something that I learned as a, an undergrad in history was uh, how to transfer that knowledge to people who may be experts or people who know nothing of what you're talking about through various mediums. Uh, speaking uh, is one of them. <laughs> And then writing, we have really good writing skills. We've got to uh, pay attention to details. Uh, we also use mediums like email and talking over the phone or creating a PowerPoint or a video. Uh, these are things that I do every day or week or month at work. And I honed those skills here. Um, I think another great thing that is useful uh, that history majors have uh, as, as far as a skill set goes is data analysis and interpretation. So when I'm looking at a site that we may choose to build a restaurant, I'm looking at the demographics. Who lives there? How many people live there? How many people are there during the day? Is it residential population? Uh, what's the traffic count? How many cars are going past? You need a big base of uh, people to support a Wendy's restaurant. So taking that and boiling that down into, yeah, we've got enough people, you know, the traffic count looks good, and uh, then is the site good? Can people see the site? Uh, and making that a decision, yes or no, uh, is something that I think history majors are extremely good at taking 
a bunch of data and boiling it down into one idea and making a decision with that idea. Uh, so critical thinking. Uh, strong writing skills come into play when I'm communicating, which is with a thousand people all the time, um, via email. It's really important to convey the right idea to the right people. Uh, beyond that, there uh, are several sites where the company either holds interest or the company is building a restaurant where I have to make a, a package that tells my executive board, the CEO, the CFO, the COO, why we think this is a good site. And not only having data, raw numbers to look at, you know, that proves to them that this is a good site, but being able to tell a story to them as to why this would make a good restaurant uh, is another wonderful skill that translates very well from history into business. So history you know, is extremely broad, business is extremely broad, and I think the skill sets between the two are very, very compatible. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, you will uh, all have a chance to uh, talk informally one-to-one -one, uh, with all of the speakers uh, after the, uh, the, the program, but uh, I think we have plenty of time to uh, entertain uh, a few questions uh, for Hal, if you have any. Yeah. Um, how did you make the transition uh, from graduating or even, I mean, you mentioned that you have been with Wendy's for several years, mm -hmm. so how did you make your transition um, from your degree into your career and did you find any um, uh, difficulty in making that transition? Sure. Uh, so the transition was completely seamless. I applied to the position, interviewed, and was accepted based on the skills that I was communicating to them that I possessed as a history major. Uh, one of the things I think I may have glossed over is uh, working individually and working on a team are things you're going to be doing a lot in the future. And uh, having that ability. So I know sometimes we don't like working with other people, right? Like you never know who's going to show up or pull their weight. Uh, so knowing your role, knowing how you can execute your area of expertise and contribute to your team uh, is extremely important. Also having the discipline to uh, you know, work independently. Um, but no, the transition was completely seamless and the skills that you know, I possessed as an undergrad of history transferred perfectly. Questions? Sure. Did you like pursuing any internships like while you were an undergrad or like clubs or activities that you really like thought stood out when you were applying? Um, I think the number one thing would be my internship with the Ohio History Center. Um, I worked in the <laughs> in the uh, <laughs> visitor studies department, so there was a lot of communication involved uh, between individuals. So. Some days I would literally just go stand on the floor and talk to whoever walked in. And if there was a cabinet that we were using there, I won't go into like loads of detail, but there was a cabinet they were using there where they put a bunch of uh, objects with no, uh, I mean aside from the fact that it was a display in the kitchens, which I think it's still there, uh, section, uh, no descriptions whatsoever of what it was. And a lot of them are really funky, odd things that you haven't seen probably because they're 100, 150 years old. Uh, so we would get into a conversation about those objects. So some of the people who came in were experts. They collect antiques. Uh, some of those people knew nothing of that. And you know, being able to communicate with uh, people who know a bunch about something or know nothing, who are curious, uh, I would say that was an asset. Yeah. Sure. Um, what would you say is the biggest difference between a private enterprise mindset and a public mindset? How would you? How did you account for that when you made the switch? Uh, we have shareholders, so <laughs> you're pleasing a lot more than just your boss, or yourself, or the individuals uh, who you work the closest with. Uh, at the end of the day, we we have people who invest in the company, and. You have to have a, there's a whole lot more going on than just right here kind of mindset. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Yes. Um, so you didn't, you didn't do an MBA or any kind of formal business study. Now, from, now that you're an insider, as it were, in that whole world of high corporate activity, 
how valuable or necessary is it to have an MBA if one were to desire to have the kind of career you have, which would seem to be like one that an MBA could be useful for? Yeah. Uh, what, what would be your view of an MBA? Is it necessary or valuable to have it? Well, so my boss and virtually everyone on my team does have an MBA. Really? And there are a few people my age who are working in a similar role who have their MBAs. Um, I am probably the least educated person on my team. Uh, so I'll use that to my advantage. Uh, <clears throat> I think an MBA is helpful for loads of reasons. Um, but I don't think it's absolutely crucial if you, if you already possess quite a number of the skills that you would learn with an MBA. The MBA might take you to the next level. I, I'm confident that it would do that. Um, but I think where I'm at, the role that I possess, uh, looking at those around me who do possess an MBA, we share the exact same skills. Uh, you know, they may have a slightly nuanced um, kind of approach Everything else is pretty flat. Are you involved in hiring at all? Uh, uh, so I'm, I was, for a period of time, involved in recruiting new franchisees. And I was the very first line of defense in that process. So when someone came in, usually it was via email or phone call, asking pretty much, hey, can I be a franchisee? Um, I was the first round of vetting, trying to figure out what experience they had, uh, if they were financially capable of purchasing or building a restaurant, which is a really expensive thing to do. And uh, pretty much it boiled down to, do you have the money and do you have a colossal amount of operations experience uh, in, in working in restaurants? And if you didn't make it past me, you weren't going to see our actual recruiter. Um, so that, that would be the okay. extent of the hiring experience. But if, if they were hiring on going on a Wendy's for people like yourself, mm -hmm. uh, how, how large would an MBA loom, loom on their horizons, as it were? How much are they actively looking for that, or is it just something that's almost incidental? Uh, so, I'm going to say based on who we have hired, and the fact that most of them, especially the individuals who are my age, under 30 or about 30, either all possess law degrees or MBAs, I'd say it's something we hold very valuable. <clears throat> but but you, you know, it's not anything specific in the training as such. It's more like uh, that these are people you know with refined general skill sets rather than specific skill sets. Typically, we we have hired people who have zero experience in what they're doing. We do tend to hire people who have franchise experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be with another restaurant company, but there are franchises with loads of different uh, you know, things. Um, so it really depends on who we find to do the best. Okay. But, yes? What would you like to be doing in five years? That is a really good question, okay. and I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, I do miss history. I miss researching. Um, you know, when I was an undergrad, I really thought, yeah, let's go do a PhD. That'd be super. And then I looked at like what that looks like, and it was kind of horrifying, because I couldn't narrow it down to one single thing that I wanted to study. I got into history because I wanted to learn everything about everything. And it's so massively broad that you can do that. If you have an interest in something and you study history, you you can just go there. Um, so five years from now, I'm not sure. I wouldn't hate if I was still with the Wendy's company. I do like my, like my job and I like the company. I'm not being paid to say that. Uh, <laughs> but that's, that's a good question that I don't have an answer for. I say there'll be plenty of time to uh, uh, talk to Hal uh, individually um, once uh, once the program is over. But I'd like to uh, move on to our next speaker, uh, uh, Stacia um, Kushetsky, um, close, close, yeah, <laughs> who's uh, director of outreach uh, at the Ohio History Connection uh, here in Columbus. Uh, she got her BA in history uh, and her MA in uh, cultural policy and arts administration from Ohio State. What she's going to tell you about is educational outreach, uh, community engagement, uh, and digital and media, media projects. So, sure. Take it away. Sometimes I can just I need to get a little time or I can start to wander. Um, so, hi everyone. Thanks for having me. It's been a few years since I've done the um, history career night, so I'm happy to be back. So, yeah, my name is Stacia Kusieski, and I'm the director of outreach at the Ohio History Connection. We're in the square building over at 17th and 71 by the fairgrounds. 
And the mission of the Ohio History Connection is to spark discovery of Ohio's stories, embrace the present, share the past, and transform the future. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, my own path, because that's something that people always seem to have some interest around, uh, talking a little bit about internships and what we're doing that excites me right now. Because in the, the public history field can be a variety of things, museums, archives, libraries, um, working with state government, city government, county commissioner, travel and tourism, you, you can get in in a variety of different ways. So my experience has all been museum based, not necessarily site based, but within a history organization. So I actually started at the Ohio History Connection, what was the Ohio Historical Society, when I was an undergraduate here and I was working part time processing audiovisual collections. And much like Hal, I assumed that I was going to go get my PhD in history and go on and do great things. And then I took the GRE, and then I was like, oh God, I need a break from all of this schooling. This is not going to work for me. So um, I actually worked part time at the um, OHC for two, my junior and senior year, and then graduated, pieced out, went overseas for a year, came back for a job with back at. The Ohio Historical Society because um, they couldn't get rid of me and I can't get rid of them either. Um, I actually interviewed for that job for my apartment in Rome and flew back and started working there a few weeks after I got home. So and from that point I was doing a lot of collections work, digitization work on Ohio Memory which is an online, um, uh, I'm blanking on my words here, um, the digitized collections from not only our collections, but from collections around the state. Then I moved into educational outreach, doing mostly teacher professional development around social studies. So working with educators, working with other um, local history organizations on how to best incorporate primary sources into the classroom, but also ways to teach history in engaging ways using the real stuff of history, basically. And so the uh, generalist nature was helpful in there. And when we're working with history teachers, especially at the elementary level, just because they're teaching history or social studies doesn't mean they have a background in it. So it was a really fun opportunity to be able to teach other people the skills that I had learned here and really open their eyes to ways that you could teach history and engage with history that weren't sort of the typical ways that people think about those folks that don't like history, who haven't had a great experience with it, to be able to give that great experience. So most recently, now I'm the director of outreach, which is a funny circular way of getting back to things that I have done, did like 10, 15 years ago, because I now manage all of our educational outreach, which includes Ohio History Day, and I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with Ohio History Day. I participated in Ohio History Day when I was in high school. Now I manage the people who are in charge of that program. Um, Ohio Memory, which I started in, and when I came back from my year overseas, I now manage the people who do that work. Um, distance learning programs, I've, um, any media video production, so a lot of the things I actually did early on in my career now there, I've circled back around to in a manager capacity, which has been kind of, which has been fun and interesting to sort of see those changes. Um, which leads me to a side note, but very interesting point, which is the field is very, very small. So, um, as my Stacia says, sort of straight talk, um, if you're going out and interning or volunteering, chances are wherever you're looking to get a job, the person you worked for at your place knows someone you're applying with. So that idea of really um, putting your best self forward, doing the work, because like I said, it's a small field and everybody knows everybody and you might even think like, oh, I'm going to a different state. Chances are if someone sees that you had worked in an area that like I was in charge of, They'll call me like, oh, hey, Stan, should you know about such and such? And we always like to be able to say, oh, my God, they were amazing. You need to hire them. Um, so along with this idea of internships, um, sort of shifting to that, I think that um, for, I only can speak for my, myself, but for me, experience trumps education at an entry level position. Um, I'm more interested in seeing people who have had some sort of experience doing the work. Um, and I think that if you're looking for an internship, 
that going in with some idea of what you want, what you're interested in doing, but being open to doing anything. So mm -hmm. we'll have people sometimes who might contact us and they're looking for an internship. But if I don't have an idea of what they want to do, it becomes difficult to place someone where they're going to be the most successful. But if someone comes in and they want to do something very specific, but that's not my business need, that's a bit of an issue too. So this idea of having some idea of what you're interested in, but not letting that dictate you from maybe going off over here. There are all sorts of things I did early on in my career that um, weren't in my quote job description, but they were. it was interesting learning opportunities for me, and they were um, sort of battle scars around some of that kind of work as well, because museum work can, you know, one day you might be doing research in the archives, the next day you're putting, you're pouring concrete and putting up Ohio historical markers, like the one that's out here, not, I did not put that one up. But, you know, so there's any variety of things you may sometimes um, end up with. We always kind of joke, I'm so glad I got this master's degree so I can, like, carry the garbage in from inside um, the village. So that idea of being open because you're not entirely sure what kind of opportunities come along. Um, another an interesting opportunity for internships are local history organizations. I know sometimes it might feel like, ooh, well, I want to intern at you know, Smithsonian, or at the Ohio History Connection, or at wherever. But a lot of times if you're at some of the smaller places, you have an opportunity to do more stuff, and a higher level of work, because they really need the help. So like, I'm not sure where everyone is from in here, but the um, pops into my head is the Alliance Historical Society in Stark County. It's an all-volunteer run organization that has a historic home, and I am sure that they would be more than happy to have summer interns help them do any number of things that need to be done that's not taking tickets, making photocopies, scanning documents, doing filing, but doing the real work of public history. So I would always encourage people to not forget about their local history organizations as potential opportunities and actually really great learning opportunities for on the ground, like engaging with the public. Um, and actually, Hal brought up something that kind of triggered um, something for me. I think another sort of straight talk is self-awareness. That's one of the things that I see the most with my own staff, is the people who are successful are the ones that have an awareness of their strengths and their weaknesses and know how to work to their strengths. So I'm not a big fan of some of the like Myers-Briggs, like those sort of uh, like work personality tests because there's there's the the part of me that thinks man don't put me in a box I can't be defined by these four letters but then there's the other part of me that when I see it in my staff I'm like oh yeah you really are an INTJ or oh yeah you're really you really are whatever and I see how it actually makes the team stronger to have these diverse viewpoints so knowing what your strengths are and being able to play to those um, strengths finder is actually something we've been using at work and that's been really fascinating to see. It gives you your top five strengths, and it's this idea that instead of working on making your weaknesses mediocre, why don't you work on making your strengths even better? So that idea of what am I good at? Like where is my skill set? And I think that that is some, gonna and that's gonna be important regardless of if you go into public history or not. But it's something that I know I see in my own staff, the, self, the people who are the most self-aware and are most self-reflective around their own work practices are the ones who are the most successful. And um, what excites me right now about my own work, so there's lots of things going on at the Ohio History Connection. It's a state history organization. There's over 50 sites around the state. We're a busy place. In my own personal work, um, we've, I've, um, I have some order and process that I need to bring to our media productions department, which doesn't always sound like super fun, but that idea of being able to craft that team to help the organization the best is something that I'm actually really looking forward to. Um, we've started a new initiative called Bringing History to Life for Ohio Students, which is all around education. And um, a colleague and I are in charge of that particular initiative, and it kind of brings me back around to the things that I was doing when I originally started there, around learning and getting um, people excited around history. And, um, and so that's kind of like coming back around and I'm just excited about that work. I'm excited to be able to work with our educators on that. I'm excited to be able to work with people in the field on that. 
And then another piece is our work around inclusivity. So um, we've been doing quite a bit of work um, with the LGBTQ population since the uh, like around 2006, and that's always been of interest to me. But we've also been doing more with community engagement and inclusivity, both in terms of hiring practices and communities in which we engage. And one of the big ones we've been doing a lot of work with now is the New American Community in Central Ohio. We have a um, really great grant-funded project that we're working on, and that has been really rewarding work to see the um, to see the ties that our organization is able to create with these communities, but also act as a community anchor for those communities, along with Columbus Department of Police, Columbus Parks and Rec, and act really as a, a bridge, a bridge builder in a sense. So really, that community work within our organization is something that I'm pretty pumped about. It's been really fun. So, um, so yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, we have time for some questions. If anybody um, has something they'd like to ask. Not all the ones now. Do you want to know what I'm going to do in five years, Mary? Sure. I'm still painting <laughs> paint into hers. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to say she, you have no clue what you're going to do in five years. <laughs> Your, your, I mean, your area does obviously depend a lot on volunteers. Mm -hmm. I mean, are there many paid positions, like actual full-time career positions available in public history right now? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, I know, so for us, we have about 170 employees within the organization. But we're one of the largest state, or state history organizations, us, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Are some of the, the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're scattered all over the state. Most of us are central, and the, but then um, the sites also have some staff as well. So you know there are jobs out there. Um, it's not like they don't exist, but like I said, I I always feel bad when I when we're hiring entry level positions and I have like a stack of eighty, you know, resumes and I've got the people who have like a master's in history or a master's in something else. And I'm just like, oh, but you haven't done any work. Like, I don't know if you know how to do this. I don't know if you know how to succeed within the workplace. And when you have that many people who are applying for jobs, I mean, it's not like I get like three applications for sure. something. You know, it just doesn't work that way. But um, it's, so it can be a competitive market. That's why I think being able to communicate your value and your worth is really important. Um, as well and having some experience and like I said you can do that kind of stuff now it doesn't have to be an official internship or at some fancy place it can be at whatever the local historical organization local libraries usually have local history collections as well and those folks are probably going to be pretty excited to have you now of course you won't get paid to do that internship probably which is a whole other issue within the museum field in general but I like your point about self-awareness, by the way. I, I, but I can't think of a profession where that isn't a valuable thing right. to have. No. I mean, it, it's something it's hard to teach. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I think it's valuable in almost any walk of life. So to work on your self-awareness, whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good yeah. But, but, you know, that much said, it really helps to have done an internship mm -hmm. because you're getting the, the hands-on experience. You can do it through History 390, uh, 3191 in this department. There are tons of positions over in mm -hmm. uh, the Ohio History Connection. Right now we have somebody working on marketing, and, and he's having a fabulous time yeah. doing it. He's doing a good job. Mm -hmm. um, Avery's my favorite student. And he's working with me now. I know. Yeah. A Avery was a student who got an internship last year and had no work experience, whatever. <laughs> None. No volunteer experience, no work experience, no nothing. And he went to work in marketing and communications, and he liked it so much that he just kept volunteering. And now? Yeah, we had a position that opened up, so we were able to, it's a temporary position right now, but, you know, it's like, we like him, and he, it was one of those things where, oh, you need somebody, you guys should look at Avery, because he's awesome. And we're like, oh, well, that makes that easy. Yeah. There, there are also um, openings for internships this summer, if you're going to be in Columbus. Mm -hmm. they're, they're like 
uh, more than half a dozen of them that are posted okay. now on the Ohio History Connection website. And there's some posted on the History website. You can do them for credit, or sometimes you can get them to pay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the broader point here is that you never know where life is going to, to take you and what opportunities are going to open up. So when your friends who are going to be a this or a that have decided as the you know, freshman year that they're going to be engineers or they're going to be a uh, uh, you know, such and such, um, you know, I mean, if they succeed, they, they wind up stuck in that job forever. Um, where you, who really can't say, oh, I'm going to be a marketing specialist, but you may wind up being a marketing mm -hmm. specialist, because the opportunity presents itself and you're prepared to take advantage of that opportunity. You have uh, flexibility and, and you have initiative. Um, so, you, you know, it's, I know it's, it's uh, uh, nerve-wracking to be uh, confronting um, expulsion from the, uh, the hallowed halls of OSU without, you know, a, a, a pre-punched ticket. Uh, but you have to trust your instincts and, and trust your opportunities, uh, your ability to, to seize the opportunities that you, you get. Uh, and speaking of seizing opportunities, uh, thank you, Stacey. Mm -hmm. um, our next speaker um, hails from uh, the ODEE department here at, at OSU, uh, which, in case you don't know, is the Office of Distance Education and E-Learning. Uh, this is Jeff Vernon, um, who is the Strategic Initiative Manager for ODEE. Uh, and has been affiliated with uh, higher education as a student, instructor, and professional for the past 18 years. Um, he earned his uh, degrees in history and political science from that, uh, that uh, institution, that school uh, out west, uh, Indiana. Uh, but um, he went on to law school, uh, which led to a job in Washington, D.C. as a law clerk, uh, and came to Ohio State in 2008 to complete his Ph.D. in modern U.S. history, um, uh, which he completed in 2015. So, you know, this is a very varied career, one that's taken him in a lot of different places, uh, but he has wound up doing something uh, terrific, which he will now uh, tell you about. Well, thank you, uh, and I also have a tendency to wander, so uh, my solution isn't necessarily a time clock, but I do have prepared remarks to keep me more focused for you. So I think often that a general misconception uh, that all IT jobs require specific and very technical skill sets is just that, a misconception. And moreover, it's believed that individuals that don't possess those skills just simply don't need to apply to IT jobs. And to be sure, there are many jobs in IT uh, that are technical in nature. That's, that's absolutely true. And these jobs do require applicants to possess a certain skill set um, that most of you probably don't possess right now. And some of those jobs, for example, are network engineers and application administrators and systems engineers and, and software developers. And one of the good things to know is that almost all of those jobs, if you want to go into that, won't require you to have a degree. You can actually succeed and secure one of those jobs. Um, it just will take you a different path to get there. And regardless, most people are, are just not aware, at least I wasn't when I was sitting in your chair, um, that a number of the jobs in IT departments actually require a broader skill set than a technical background. These jobs include fiscal officers, office administrators, business analysts, project managers, program coordinators, training specialists, support analysts, market researchers, sales, relationship managers, and that's just at a glance. There's even more. Um, so perhaps a great place for me to start is to give you a little bit of an overview about my background, what my job is. Uh, as uh, Nate mentioned, I'm the Strategic Initiatives Manager. My job is actually a collection uh, of a number of activities that are associated with a diverse uh, set of job classifications with IT. Um, I do a lot of market research in the educational technology space. Uh, this includes examining market tools uh, that the university might adopt, uh, educational tools that the university might adopt, and also looking at how other institutions uh, have positioned themselves and what tools they have chosen. Um, and particularly those schools that are, are similar to ours, large research institutions. Uh, and ours, in, in that sense, is also unique. We have over 60,000 undergraduate students here, and that is uh, one of the largest undergraduate populations of any university in the United States. And a related function of my job is relationship management. I work with departments and colleges all over the university 
uh, to understand the challenges that uh, they face, uh, particularly when it comes to technology and how we can solve those problems. For example, one of my recent projects is a number of departments here on campus are looking to try to offer uh, public education uh, in a way that they can use our platforms to do so. And because of the security lockdowns that we have, simply can't do that. So we're looking for a technical solution to allow those departments to offer continuing education requirements to the general population uh, more broadly. One of the largest components of my job, uh, similar to how actually, happens to be project and portfolio management. I work on a team that delivers the tool sets and technologies that many of you have used in, in, in class, including the Canvas Learning Management System. And project managers, uh, for those of you who aren't really familiar with, organize the efforts of these teams, they create standard processes to govern the workflow, and they measure and document the work within a project. Um, and my role uh, not only does this for one project now, but it does it for a multitude of projects in an actual portfolio. So hopefully in describing my job, I've kind of given you some sense that you don't really need to have a technical background um, to do jobs in IT. Uh, and many of the people that we employ actually in our organization don't have uh, technical degrees. And in fact, many of them come from the humanities. Um, and for some reasons I'll, I'll discuss in, in just a moment. And so one of the things that you may be asking yourself is uh, how uh, I actually use the skills that I acquired uh, as an undergraduate history major um, in my job every day. And so let me uh, relate just a quick story to you. Uh, so way back in the day when I was an undergraduate sitting in the chair that uh, you're sitting in now, majoring in history and political science, I had a brief conversation with my cousin. And uh, at the time, my cousin was also in college as well, and he was majoring in, in, in IT. And uh, I was thinking about going to law school, wanted to go to law school, and I, I looked at him, this was just after the dot-com uh, bubble had burst in the 1990s, I said, I, you know, I, I got to tell you, I don't know that your prospects are going to be quite good. Uh, and not only is the dot-com bubble bursting, but I'm looking around and seeing this huge push of mm -hmm. IT majors in, in college going out into the workforce. I just don't think there's going to be demand. So you should probably take away a couple of lessons from this. One, uh, as you probably have noticed before, uh, historians are not really good predictors and forecasters of the future. They're not particularly really good at that. Um, and the other thing is it really demonstrates one of the first skills that I want to highlight to you tonight, which is critical thinking. And Hal mentioned a little bit of that before. After that, I really thought hard about why I thought that and what I could change about my analysis. Um, and I think that uh, all of you have been trained to think critically so far. And in the years that followed, I asked myself this and what assumptions I had made. And I won't bore you with those conclusions because I think that you would get bored, but <laughs> what I do think is relevant is that I was equipped because of my degree to re-examine those assumptions as I approached uh, my job search in other fields. And the history coursework that I had uh, up to that point allowed me to do that. Uh, and in my current job, I work with a lot of engineers that are spoke, you know, really focused on specific technical problems. They often lose sight of the big picture. And one of the things that I bring to that team that is different from those engineers is that I can examine it from a systems level. I can look at the broader picture. And I was trained to do that as a historian, and so are you. Another skill set that you possess that, that going into IT, uh, the engineers don't have the same background as research. There isn't a day that goes by that I'm not researching something in my current role. And the, by the completion of your degree here, um, you will also have those same skills. And a broad range of general research will be resourceful in the way you can attempt to find materials and resources. You'll be trained in how to seek uh, a broader understanding before diving into the deeper details. And you have a skill set to find the answers and problems uh, when they're not readily apparent. One of the things when we hire uh, new individuals coming on to the team, we always look for people who, uh, when presented with an issue or a question they don't know the answer to, not only is willing to admit it, but will describe a way in which they will find the answer. Because I can promise you, uh, you will not know everything when you enter the, uh, the job market and uh, enter any job that you apply for and succeed in. You just simply won't. You'll have to research and find the answer to something. Organization and argumentation. Um, through the research projects you've completed as an undergrad, you've been trained 
um, to organize materials and provide a rational uh, argument supported by specific evidence. And each week, I write reports on a wide range of topics, and I'm required to justify my opinions and my rationale. And in order to do that, I have to cite evidence. And you've been trained to do that as a history major. And of course, we've talked about it before already tonight, is communication. It's a big one. Um, you know, it's, it's a core function of what I do, is to facilitate communication within our team, um, but also within the broader organization and also throughout the university when it comes to the interaction between our organization and other departments. It's probably easier to see how you've developed those written communication skills by writing papers and, and whatnot, which without question, that's important. Um, and as I mentioned, I write those reports on a weekly basis, both status reports of my projects uh, and also um, market research reports. But you also have the, the ability to, to communicate verbally. You've been trained through discussion sections, right, through discussions in your classes to quickly and specifically cite material to justify your, your opinions. Um, and so don't let, don't let the you know, the traditional thinking about how you've been trained with written communication box you in. You have a very broad um, skill set. And so to bring it all together now, there are, are a number of jobs in, in IT that do not require technical skill sets. Indeed, I, I recently read a, a, an industry, an inside industry report um, from Apple and Google that were also seeking um, skills outside of engineering. And specifically, they wanted people with background in humanities. Um, and IT firms across the globe are also wanting individuals with background in humanities because the skill sets that you have are simply not taught in engineering departments. One good example of that is most of you or many of you probably have a smartphone with you tonight. And the interaction that you do with that smartphone, right, certainly an engineer designed that software and interface, but the actual interaction, your experience with it was designed by people who specialize in user interface. Uh, they work with the engineers to, to tell them how that function should exist, how it should be coded, because for most of us, we don't think like software engineers. We don't want to think like software engineers, <laughs> right? And so we have to, the products that we consume have to be designed in a way that for the vast pu public are, are consumable. Um, and so that is, uh, one clear example of uh, where software engineers simply don't have the background and skill set through their, the tunnel vision in which they approach problems to do the same skill set uh, that you have uh, in front of you. So, in some kind of parting words, how do you get a job in IT? And so, uh, let's first make sure that you examine the skill set that you have. Um, approach it broadly. Some of them I've outlined for you tonight, but there are others that you'll find. One of my best pieces of advice for you is to look at job <coughs> postings, starting well before you graduate. And imagine that you're being forced to apply for jobs, and particularly jobs that you don't think that you're actually qualified to do. Think that, you know, imagine that you're being forced to do so through the unemployment department. Um, and think about how you would structure an application um, for those jobs. And then when you approach jobs that you are actually applying for that you feel good about, you feel like you are an outstanding candidate for, you have now made a list of all the attributes that you have in areas that you never thought before existed um, and never thought that uh, necessarily your skill set existed in that way uh, to apply for the jobs in which you uh, would be an excellent applicant for. Um, and in that way, I think your applications will be much stronger. So, finally, let me say that I, I think you possess a formidable skill set in the marketplace. And, but there's also simply no denying the fact that you don't possess the training in technical areas. Regardless of what you'd like to do with your degree and career, you should think about pairing your degree with either some additional experience, training, maybe a minor, um, to help balance that out in the application uh, process in the, in the job market. Uh, you might consider learning coding, for example, either formally or informally. Uh, and again, most one of the great attributes of the IT field today is uh, it's very open to people who do not have a, a degree uh, in technology. 
Uh, many of the developers that we hire do not have degrees in, in, in software development, um, but are self-taught, uh, and we hire them. Uh, you might consider learning to code, and coding is a, a skill that's really valuable in any career path because its, it's foundation is logical reasoning. And next year, if you're still here next year, uh, you will have the opportunity to learn Swift, which is the uh, coding language behind Apple products uh, through our partnership with, with Apple that was recently announced. Uh, and this is one of the only institutions in the country that has that partnership. <clears throat> that uh, coding, and coding knowledge will be provided to you for free if you want to sign up for it. Um, so consider taking advantage for that. As far as if you want to pursue something specifically like what I have done, there are a number of resources that you can take advantage of to learn how to do project management for free. If you're a member of the Columbus Metropolitan Library, uh, there's a, a free uh, uh, business uh, learning, uh, uh, online learning software called Linda that has both business analytics, IT, coding, networking, lots of different kinds of courses that you can take. Uh, again, the, your subscription is free with just a membership of the Columbus Metropolitan Library to give you a basic background, at the very least, in vocabulary in the technology um, field. So one final observation that I'll kind of leave you with is the history degree with its focus on critical thinking, research, and analysis often assumes a, an inquisitive mind, a lifelong learner. Utilize that instinct. Uh, make sure that you think of your education as a a long lifetime process and regardless of the path that you do choose, whether it's IT or, or business or public history, um, don't be scared away by the unknown or the unfamiliar um, because most of the people applying for jobs in the future um, will have to have learned something new uh, in the past few years and apply that. Uh, at the very least, uh, within your career, you will always be learning something new. If you have any questions for me, I, I work here at the university, have a name dot number, it's V-E-R-N-O-N, Vernon.51. Happy to talk to you anytime. Uh, we're also looking at some point in the future to be hiring a student uh, to work with us, uh, a uh, marketing research or market research uh, intern. So uh, look for that job posting if you're interested, and we'd be happy to, to have you. And, uh, and I think with that, I can either take questions or I might have exceeded my time. <laughs> so, so, right? We have plenty of time, and uh, yes, we can take a few questions if, if you have it. I was actually at something today, I think one of your colleagues was presenting at, because they were talking about the coding, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, that would be, like, that would be something, to have that opportunity, mm -hmm. Because, like I said, I've got video and media production. We have digital projects. Like even in my, I've got people who have done basically what you said, what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one thing to point out is that um, um, Jeff is a, a uh, example of the fact that there is life after a PhD <laughs> in history. Um, so if you I do, uh, you are motivated to. Um, to go on to graduate school, as um, uh, it, it does not necessarily mean that you will you will um, wear a lot of tweed, grow a beard, and wear glasses. Um, <laughs> you will you have uh, opportunities. So it's strongly uh, encouraged. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have perfect vision, you may think about a career in technology after your PhD. But, um, so you know, there a uh, graduate degree in history, you know, is is a a calling card. Uh, it does not necessarily mean that you are going to, to uh, have to spend the rest of your life in higher education. Lots of careers that, that can be open to you. Um, okay, well, as I said, there will be an opportunity to talk to, uh, to Jeff um, mm -hmm. um, individually after after the presentation. But uh, let's um, welcome another Ohio State uh, grad, uh, Larry Krupp, who majored in probably the most uh, um, recondite and uh, seemingly impractical Field, uh, in uh, uh, history, ancient history, and classics of all things. Is that still a major? Uh, it is still a major. Yeah, there were like very few of us when I did that. Very few, and, and yeah. getting fewer all the time. Right, so I also have a minor in um, archaeology. In anthropology, yes, in anthropology. In anthropology. And uh, he has a master's in American history with certificates in historic preservation from the University of Cincinnati. He's worked in historic preservation and cultural resource management. Uh, since uh, 1987. Uh, he's a principal of O&M Eastlake, a historic preservation firm uh, here in Columbus. So uh, he will tell you about uh, career opportunities there. Okay, so what I do is I'm um, historic preservation and cultural resource management. 
it's kind of the same thing, except historic preservation is when you want to do it, and cultural resource management is when someone makes you do it, such as the federal government. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, I started in 83 and graduated in 94. I was on the 10-year plan, so it's a good like 80s undergraduate. I had Dr. Rosenstein about 1987. So, so my route to history was a little serendipitous. I have my minors in archaeology, and I had a field school one summer in North American archaeology. And when it was done, the professor said, does anyone want a job in this? Someone called me, and they need someone to go ahead of a pipeline and dig things up. So I'm like, I'll, you know, why not? I'll do that for this summer. I have anything to do. So my brother dropped me off in southern Indiana, like thinking I would be killed. You know, <laughs> it's crazy. And I worked the rest of the summer on an excavation. So 13 of them actually a series across southern Indiana where they had previously found a site and we tested it. And so we found some things, but not a lot. And when I got back at the end of the summer, I got a job at a local environmental consulting firm. A little part-time for like 10 hours a week, and I washed rocks. Because they did archaeology too, and I'm like, I did a field school, they're like, come on down. <laughs> so I washed rocks, but since I was also a historian, um, they let me write county histories, or township histories that go in the reports that you write when you like make a highway or something like that. Depending on how big the project is, there could be a lot of townships. So naturally a highway has more. If we would do like a little coal mine or something like that, or an air vent for a coal mine, one township, and you go out and look at it, and things like that. So, I would go out in the field quite a bit, and um, while you're out there, you also look at houses, objects, buildings, bridges. Is it eligible for the National Register, or is it not? And you have to decide out there and make a recommendation so that the ship, the State Historic Preservation Office, can say yay or nay. You've got to like go around it, save it, dig it up, do something with it. But you can't destroy it in the end. So I did that for quite a while, for years. So it gradually um, increased my responsibilities from like digging little holes to running excavations, um, writing larger and larger reports, and doing more and more research, and doing more architectural history things. So identifying houses, bits and pieces, things like that. And so as I did it, like the projects got bigger. So a couple years ago, I went into excavation of a Shaker settlement in Lebanon, Ohio, and um, worked on that for a couple months. We excavated four buildings, found quite a bit of stuff, and at the end, there was an archival component, and no one wanted to do it. I'm like, that's crazy. Why would you want to do this? And it involved reading all of the diaries and day books that they had written. So they dropped off this like box of microfilm by my desk, 36 reels of microfilm. So for eight months, Eight hours a day, I rode my bike to work and read diaries and day books and tried to figure out the history of everything that we had excavated. And so, and then spent another year with three other people writing a four volume report, which you can get online. So, they changed the highway, that's how we had to do it. They straightened the curve in the highway and went through the village. So, I do things like that. So, there's like a lot of research components involved and, you know, archaeology at times. And another, after that, I had another large project, which is about locks and dams. Right before, the, uh, during the recession, is like the Obama job, one of the shovel-ready things. The um, Corps of Engineers has an easement on 200 feet of each side of the Ohio River that they can flood. For some, you know, people don't know it, but yeah, they can expand. So they wanted to keep track of everything that they could flood and wipe out. So for a year, I went up and down the Ohio and looked at locks and dams and houses that they might wipe out if they like something cut loose. At that point, the recession was in full bore. So I'm like, I'm gonna go back to school because I just had a grad undergraduate degree and just like had gradually worked my way up. But at a point, I could know like I can't sign, re couldn't sign reports and things like that to send them in. Like my boss could do it, so I'd write it and then hand it off. So I'm like, I'm gonna go get my master's. So I went to Cincinnati, did that, got a scholarship, got it paid for, did my TA thing, the whole deal in American history. And I got my certificate in preservation, you know, breezed through that, because I'd already done it pretty much. And then when I got out, I went into business. So I've done that for six years now. And then I do more preservation now. I do some cultural resource management still. We have, like experts in low head dams, which is a weird thing. But some are historic and some aren't. And so, but before you pull it out, you have to make sure it's not one of the historic ones. 
And if it is, we just make an architectural drawing of it and go from there. The other thing we do is we write up a lot of histories of things for people or developers and things like that. And right now we have a contract with a Go out with history connection. We're writing a history of 20th century African American civil rights in Ohio, and we're looking for associated historic sites. So I spent the last month driving around Ohio looking at places that might be um, National Register worthy in the civil rights context, as well as like spending like like four months before that, like just doing archival research, like figuring out like how civil rights worked in Ohio versus a national context, like what's, what makes it different here than it was any place else, and that type of thing. So a lot of things is figuring out like, how do things, history differs locally than like a national thing, or does it differ from like the general literature, and that type of thing. And for that, we just like go back to the source, like archival, or if we have to, we'll just dig it up. So, and try and figure it out. So, essentially that's what I do. So, and have done. So, it's history. I write papers and stuff. I just wrote a paper about um, cultural landscapes in the Serpent Mound, how it affected the stratigraphy of the, of the mound. It was restored in the 30s and no one had figured it out. I found a receipt for it, like, they restored it. It's not supposed to be restored. Which, you know, they put another layer on, which changes a lot of things. So, yeah. So, essentially, I do history. I write papers all day, is basically what I do. Or do research. So. That's about it. Okay. Um, questions? Rory, how do you see a job in Pittsburgh preservation these days? You know, there are like um, large like engineering companies that do it. So I think you can still get in dot, yeah, and work your way up. Yeah. It's not real glamorous when you start off. You're guaranteed to get poison ivy most of the time and <laughs> things like that, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of field work, but it's doable. Have you had anything to do with the newest earth, earth, at all? The newest? Newark. Uh, no. no. I, it was included in my paper, because it too was restored, and they used the same technique on the serpent mound, which they didn't know. So, it's you about... Know, it was, it's, I mean, it's, isn't this a golf club all uh, around it, right? They, they yeah. still insist that they own this... There are some controversies about, yeah, the ownership and stuff like that. So, yeah. Or like just getting onto it. I mean, you get your twice a year, you can go visit it. Unless you're golfing. So. The golf course is on one of the major golf courses in Europe. Yeah, they've on one. Yeah. Well, um, let's uh, move on to a uh, uh, speaker who needs uh, certainly no introduction to uh, any of you. Um, Professor Greg Anderson um, is a uh, professor here in the history department, also the uh, graduate studies chair. Uh, and I might add, recently, the uh, uh, recipient of the Alumni Distinguished Teaching Award, uh, the highest accolade that this university gives uh, for, uh, for teaching. Um, he teaches what some might say is the best field of history, ancient uh, Greek history, but of course those people have not taken Roman history. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, he is a graduate of uh, that uh, distinguished university um, uh, to the east, uh, Yale University, uh, where he received his uh, graduate degrees. Uh, and he will uh, tell you about graduate studies in history here at Ohio State. So without further ado, please take it away. Thank you, Nate. And uh, thank you to Maria and Ray for organizing this event and for having me here. Uh, I'll try not to bore the life out of you. Um, First of all, just to be clear, I'm going to be talking mainly about PhD study as graduate study. MA study is really quite different in many ways. Uh, it's more of a kind of extension of the kinds of things you do already as an undergrad. Mostly uh, MAs are instructional classes, uh, courses or programs where you carry on taking courses. You may get to do a slightly longer thesis at the end of it than you would have done as an undergrad, but it's still more of an extension of what you've already been doing than a genuine break towards doing something new and different. And the PhD is a very different thing from uh, uh, an undergraduate program of study. So that's really what I'm going to be focusing on. I would also add before I start that uh, uh, I strongly encourage people to think about doing gap years, as it were, before uh, going plunging in. Obviously, anyone contemplating uh, graduate study, whether MA or PhD, 
uh, you've already done at least probably four years, most of you, if not more, of an under undergrad study. There are uh, multiple reasons why it's good to take at least a year off to do something very different. Uh, I myself taught English as a foreign language for two years and ended up living in Japan. And it was actually, with all due respect to Yale, far more seminal in my intellectual development than the, the six years I spent in that rather pretentious place. Uh, so, uh, you know, you don't have to teach English, but there's a lot of different things you can do. Like, uh, a high history connection will be a mm -hmm. wonderful thing if you can uh, get a position there. Uh, it gives you a distance from your, from your educational, academic track, so that you can see, uh, see yourself, as it were, traveling forward, and um, get a sense of what it is you really feel excited by. What is it you really want to do? Uh, instead of just kind of getting on the next train that comes through the station, Take some time off, leave the station, go somewhere totally different. Uh, you know, see yourself in a different environment, and by doing so, you will, uh, you know, learn a lot about yourself and whether this sort of thing really is for you. Um, all right, let me just start by saying about the differences between undergrad and PhD study. PhD study is professional training. You're basically training to be one of us. Uh, that is, people who teach people like you. Um, and this really involves two elements. One is that you are expected to acquire a professional level expertise in a field, whether it's early American history, modern American history, ancient Greek history, ancient Roman history, whatever it is. You have to be able, you will be examined on and expected to know uh, the main details of an entire field. Uh, because assuming you get through and do get a job at the future, at the end of it all, you will be teaching survey classes mostly. That will be what your bread and butter courses will be, which require you to have that kind of broad field knowledge. The second thing is to acquire particular specialist knowledge of a particular area within that field. Uh, and that's generally the area where you will write your dissertation. And for many people, ever afterwards, the area for which they are known as being particular experts in. So let's say if I'm a Greek history guy, Athenian democracy might be my particular area of study, something like that. Uh, a big part of, but not by any means all of, Greek history. Uh, so really it's getting on top of those two things, the general field coverage and the specialist knowledge of a particular area within the field are what you are going to the PhD program for. And uh, there's a lot more self-direction involved in a PhD program than there is in an undergraduate program. Of course, all of you need to have motivations, you need to drive yourself to work when you don't feel like it and all of that. But in, at the PhD level, a, a lot of what you want to come out at the end of it knowing, you are not required to know for any class. You've got to learn it for yourself because you want to know, because you want to be that expert on that field. So if you don't feel that incredible kind of hunger, uh, that curiosity for knowledge, to want to exhaustively know Roman history or something like that, then you really aren't in the right place because that's what you've got to have. Yes, to a point, the courses you take while you're there will cover chunks of the, that field, but there are going to be loads of gaps. You've got to pass general exams in it. You will do reading. You will have reading lists along the way. Uh, and you've got to want to do it for yourself, really. You shouldn't need someone there to tell you. Uh, so uh, you're not being prodded all the time in the way undergrads are, where you're constantly given assignments, you have to respond. Here, yes, we, you know, we, we give graduate students assignments, but they're not all of it by any means. A lot of it has to come from within. You need that kind of will to know, as it were. Uh, if you don't have that, then I'm not sure you'd be really comfortable in a PhD world. All right, practical things. Getting into a PhD program, if this is what you want to do. I'd say right up front, first of all, you really do have to get into these days, particularly a strong program, to have any realistic chance of getting a job as a professor at the end of it. And now, the, what is, constitutes a strong program will vary from field to field. Uh, a lot will depend on the particular persons around who you can study with. Obviously, there's no point going to, to Harvard to study something if they don't have anybody there who is an expert in what you're doing. It's, it's a great name, but of course it is. But if there's no one there for you to work with, to guide you in your studies, pointless going there. Go somewhere where there will be 
at least one person, if not ideally a few, who can guide you in, a, in the direction you want to go. But it should be somewhere that you know people have heard of. I mean, uh, uh, my own particular field, very traditional, it tends to be the very old, sort of crusty, famous places like the Ivy League, Stanford, Chicago, those kind of places where uh, it's considered sort of prestigious, or Michigan, Berkeley, the very best uh, public universities. Those are the ones that get you in. With other fields, it'll be somewhat different, but as a general rule of thumb, uh, the Ivy Leagues are almost never a bad place to have a degree from, as uh, we could certainly say the same for Chicago, or Stanford, the other really well-known private research universities. Of course, the Big Ten universities, except Purdue, which I don't suppose has too many PhDs in history, or uh, maybe it does, I don't know, but uh, uh, the Big Ten, Pac-10 type places, uh, you know, not just flagship universities that are research universities in states, but that are known for being good at doing history. Uh, so what are, you, what are you looking for to get into such a place? Uh, I'll just give you a very brief guide to what we look for when we receive applicants to our program here. Uh, first of all, GPA. I'd say if you have less than a 375, then it's a little margin. You've got to ideally be, these days, 375 to 4, I think, in that kind of range, uh, to be really competitive for a PhD. Uh, GRE, uh, we want to see, uh, we, we don't give a crap about maths or anything like that, but verbal, we want to see 90%, 90 percentile. Uh, verbs, as almost every speaker has said, speaking and writing are huge parts of what we do. So uh, verbal ability is very, very important. And uh, unfortunately, our university does give a crap about uh, the, the, the math score and the, the whatever the other one is. Uh, for their own strange reasons, we hate it, but we don't have any choice. We have, to, we have to go for it. But obviously, we ourselves care most about the verbal stuff. Um, courses, field background. Uh, you know, have as many courses under your belt in the general area, field area, that you want to work in. If it's Greek history, take all the Greek history classes you possibly can before you go. Um, you know, ideally we'd like to see, I'd say, somewhere between four, five, and ten classes already taken that are touching on, at least, the area that you are applying to study, in the field area. Languages. Of course, if you're doing American history, this isn't such a problem. But almost anything else, other than maybe British history or, I don't know, Australian or Canadian history, languages are going to be a big part of it. You've got to see this coming because uh, we were, I mean, let's say for ancient history, we expect people to have usually at least three years of Greek or Latin plus two years of the other one. So that's a lot of languages, you know, what, just to be doing it every year you'd have to have started at the beginning of your sophomore year to get three years of language under your belt. Uh, otherwise, you're going to go to a program and be spending way too much time doing the languages, where instead of doing the history that you're actually there to do. So, see it coming, and, and I would recommend, if you, if you aren't going to have those languages, do consider doing a master's degree, a terminal master's somewhere, uh, in a program that will allow you to acquire them while building further up your history resume, as it were. Uh, but do think about that. Letters of recommendation. It's never too soon to ingratiate yourself with faculty who will be effective letter writers. Uh, always best to get letters from the faculty who've taught you at a higher level class rather than a lower level class, in a smaller rather than a larger class, for obvious reasons. They'll know you better. They'll be able to judge your abilities better. Uh, and um, obviously the closer they are to the field you're applying for, the better. Statement, personal statement. What we, we don't really want to see the kind of undergrad personal statements where it's all about, you know, some flashing, blinding insight you had when you woke up one morning and, uh, you know, those kinds of super personalized stories. I mean, we just, you know, that would actually help reject you from our file. What we want to see is someone who is aware of what it takes to do well in a PhD program and has thought maturely about what is likely to happen once they come to Ohio State, while explaining to us why Ohio State would be a great place for them to do what they want to do, i.e. they already know Professor Rosenstein's here, or Professor Bracky, or Professor Sessa, or whoever it is, and these are the people who will be ideal for them when they get here. So it doesn't have to be 
super precise to the point that you're saying, and when I get there, I want to write my dissertation on and give a title. Uh, we don't want to see anything that precise, but we do want to see that you have a sense of what it's going to take to get through um, and to show a kind of intellectual maturity that you have that those basic sort of uh, qualifications to get through it, as it were. Finally, writing sample. Again, please send something that's at least close to the area you want to be studying. I mean, we've had, I had uh, an applicant this year who was, was he writing about Chuck Norris, some Chuck Norris movie from the 1980s, to, and he's writing to study ancient history. I mean, it was an interesting essay on an interesting topic, but it was so far away from what we do. How can I take that person seriously? I mean, please, it's obvious. You know, if you're applying to do ancient history, give us something on ancient history. If you happen to have done an undergrad thesis, and that's always a great idea if this is the direction you want to go in. In fact, I'd almost say it's necessary because it'll itself show that you have already all of the necessary kind of inclinations and aptitudes uh, for this. Use a chapter or section of your thesis as a writing sample. And there, you need to show that you can engage with uh, both, uh, if it's uh, something that requires foreign languages, you've got to show you can use them in that writing sample and also engage with scholarship. Finally, really, is it for me? Well, I mean, do you have that passion? Do you have that calling? And do you have the kind of credentials which will allow you to succeed? Um, do you have the drive and determination? Uh, talent is, gets you some of the way, but uh, we, you know, those of us who have graduate degrees all know too well that it wasn't always the most talented people who flourished the most. Uh, uh, you know, you've got to have certain extra levels of resourcefulness, drive and determination, just such that no one is going to deny you this, this path in life that you want for yourself. Some people just don't have that necessary commitment, however bright they are. Uh, and a certain independence. You don't need to be told what to do. You can already see what you need to do and are willing to do it as far as possible for yourself. So I'll shut up, and if anyone has any questions, uh, please do go ahead and ask. Yes? I'm curious, how broad a survey are we looking here? Can I say, like, oh, I study uh, 19th century Europe? Is that too narrow? Or well, I mean, think about the classes you've taken here, uh, um, what, uh, what those were like. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, most college, most college jobs will require you to teach pretty broad survey classes. I mean, quite possibly if you're a U.S. specialist, you have to, will now and again at least have to teach a survey on the entirety of American history. It's quite possible. Now, no one's going to expect you to be expert on all of that. But certainly, yes, I'd say a, at least a century or so as your, your main sort of home field, as it were. And then within that, you know, you can specialize in Jacksonian era, whatever it is, or something like that. That's sort of roughly what we've been talking about. Okay, good question. Any other questions? No. What percentage of the uh, students you accepted this year already have an MA? That's a good question, and I think the number has gone up over the years generally, would you say, May? Uh, I mean, it, may, it stands to reason that, again, people with MAs already show certain inclinations, they show certain abilities, and all, they're already in a way a little further along the path. So we're getting something closer to the finished product when they come. Um, so it's, uh, there's less risk. It's more of a known quantity if we take people with MAs. So there's absolutely no reason not to consider doing one. You will, it will, I think, more often than not be considered a stronger application, assuming you did well in the MA program, uh, if you have one under your belt as well. It would, of course, boost your language uh, background. It'll boost your course background as well. Why wouldn't we prefer to have someone who's taken 10 classes in the field uh, who's got an MA rather than five who's only got an undergrad degree? Maybe the undergrad has a slightly higher GPA. And sure, we, we do, I think this year, we may have even accepted someone who came straight from BA. Some people just come across as kind of amazing, you know, and, uh, but I think uh, it's safer to have a master's degree as well. Good question. Any others? everyone for uh. <laughs> <laughs> good for their future although there is there's is life after a PhD um, so uh, finally this evening um, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce the last speaker um, of the evening who is uh, is Brandy Williams uh, Brandy's one of the people that you will really want to get to know um, 
as you start building your resume. Um, she joined the, uh, the Arts and Sciences Career Services Office in 2005 as a job search advisor, and in September 15, she, uh, 2015, she assumed the role of career preparation advisor. She also serves as the liaison to the Arts and Science Recruitment and Diversity Office and holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Kaplan University and a master's of labor in human, re uh, human resources from uh, Ohio State's uh, Fisher School of uh, College of Business. So, Brandy, please take it away. Hi. Well, good evening and thanks for having me. Um, so thus far, you've heard a lot about um, several exciting careers, um, you've heard about the importance of having um, great experience and skills and competencies. So in my office, our goal is to help you put all those puzzle pieces together. Um, so to help you identify how to get to the particular career that you have an interest in. Um, to help you identify you know, what experiences can you attain and how do you find those particular resources and connect to employers. Um, so you know, I am a career prep advisor. And so in my role, I can, you know, we can sit down, have an appointment, and kind of just address any questions you might have, um, give you guidance specific to your needs. Now, one of the first steps to ut utilizing our services is to have your resume reviewed. So by a show of hand, hands, how many have a resume or have been to our office before? Okay, not bad, very good. All right, so that will be your first step. Um, and then once your resume is reviewed and approved, you can meet with myself or one of our other career prep advisors. Now, in your folder, there are several handouts that will be beneficial to you. One of them that I want to point out, actually, if I have time, I will sh share each of them. But one of them is on the purple form, and it's, are you career ready? So this is really significant because it goes over the different competencies that employers look for. So there's an association called um, NACE, which stands for the National Association of Colleges and Employers. And each year, um, they do a variety of surveys of employers. So they ask them, you know, what type of skills are they looking for on a resume? Um, what type of competencies are they looking for in their candidates, specifically undergraduate students? And so this handout goes over each of those particular competencies that the employers have identified. So the way that you can use this, um, it gives you a, like a definition of each of the competencies and then highlights a variety of different ways of actually enhancing, developing, and maintaining that competency. And all the examples are either something that you um, can get access to that's on campus or something that's fairly close to campus, all right? And you'll notice that the competencies that are highlighted were mentioned today. So like communication skills, critical thinking, stuff along teamwork, um, things along those lines. So that's really significant because your experience is valuable, but having those transferable skills so an employer knows that you know what you gain can transfer to their particular organization. And then it was also mentioned earlier um, that you know the skills are significant, but also having that self-awareness and so being able to communicate that to an employer. Because you can look wonderful on paper, but if you're not able to communicate that, then it can really be a hindrance to you, all right? So that's one beneficial resource. Another pertaining to experience, so how many are familiar with FutureLink or have utilized FutureLink? Okay, all right. So FutureLink is our online jobs and internship database. It also has experience related to research, um, volunteer opportunities, pretty much all forms of experiential learning. So the pink handout gives a brief overview of FutureLink, and then at the very top there, it highlights several internships that are currently in the system. So you're not limited to these by any means, but just for the purpose of showing you the variety of opportunities that exist. And so whether you want to work in government, you want to do something with business or nonprofit, you know, that opportunity is at your fingertips. But it's just a matter of you taking the steps now, not waiting until you're a senior, um, but starting now to actually get that exposure and that experience. And even if you are a senior, that's fine. 
we're here to help you out so we can still identify opportunities to help you build your resume, okay? Um, and aside from actually getting experience, we have a number of um, career and employer events such as career fairs, information sessions, where you can meet with employers one-on-one, -on -one, build your network, and you know enhance those relationships with employers. Okay. So that's um, the yellow handout highlights a variety of different job paths for history majors. So again, you are you know there's several um, sectors that you can work in, and this kind of highlights various job titles the particular locations as far as businesses uh, that are available. So if anything, like say you're kind of not sure what you want to do, but perhaps a particular title um, or this description appears sound, sounds of interest to you, you could take a moment to maybe just explore those particular occupations. Like the Occupational Outlook Handbook is a resource where you can search various occupations by title and it gives you a lot of background, it shares you know, how to get in that particular field, it identifies related career fields, so just so you can understand the variety of what exists for you. Okay. So internships are significant, also your coursework is significant. I mentioned volunteering, all that is going to be beneficial. So the green form is constructing your career plan. So what we've done here is pinpointed uh, just various tasks, suggestions, activities to consider between now and graduation. And so you'll see the columns pertain to career, academics, and beyond the classroom. Because it's because your experience is a mixture of everything. All right. So you may not do everything that's on, you know, both pages. You may not do anything in order, that's fine, that's not the purpose of it. But it's just to highlight, you know, make you aware of the opportunities and experiences that are available to you and that will be beneficial for your future. Okay, because ultimately you want to make sure that you're preparing so that you're more competitive. And it is, it can be overwhelming. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but just know that you don't have to do that on your own. Okay. In our office, we send a lot of different emails, you know, out. I'm sure each of you may have gotten some before. And the key is just not to delete them. Because, <laughs> I mean, I know you get lots of emails from a little bit of everybody on campus. But, you know, take a minute, kind of scan what we're, you know, offering to you, what we're trying to market, and see if it's something you want to consider. Okay. Um, also, so as you are applying for positions, you know, you get that call back and it's time for an interview. So one, another resource that we offer are mock interviews. And so with the mock interview, we would um, ask that you provide for us a sample job description. So maybe you do have actual interview lined up and maybe you just want to get some practice. Either is fine, but we would still ask for that job description. And so then we can tailor the questions that we ask you to something that will be more realistic, all right? So I have these little half sheets. They are not in your folder. But if you're interested, you're more than welcome to take one of those. So that just explains the process when you go to the website of how to actually schedule a mock interview. A handout that is in your folder is the blue interview preparation checklist. So, you know, sometimes we're not quite sure of the steps that we need to take to prepare for an interview. Okay? So it's not just a matter of showing up, right? It's a lot that you gotta do in advance. And so this takes you step by step before, during, and after an interview. Um, one thing that sometimes we forget to do is to send a thank you email after your interview. And that is significant, because that can make a difference between you and the next candidate. You may stand out because the employer sees that you took the time, that you're really interested in the position. And so, you know, you took that time to thank them for their time and consideration. So that 
is what this handout consists of. Um, and then also sometimes when you're interviewing, we maybe, you, I guess kind of forget what you want to say because you're excited about the opportunity um, and you have a lot that you want to get out there, but it kind of just all fades away or you just feel like you're rambling, okay? So a handout, another handout that's not in your folder is this behavioral-based interviews handout so feel free to grab one of those if you're interested and what that is um, it just highlights how to answer questions because nine times out of ten the questions that you are being asked are either going to be a situational question or behavioral based so what would you do in this situation or tell me about a time when you had to do this that or the other so what this handout is highlighting is the star technique and that stands for situation, task, action, and results. So it just allows you to kind of think through your question, I mean the question in advance, and what your response might be. So on the very front, it gives an example of what it looks like to use the STAR technique. And then on the back, it allows you to practice in advance. So say you were applying for um, an IT position. <clears throat> so then you need like analytical skills, right? Um, and so that could be one of the skill sets or dimensions that you highlight in this box. And then you would think in advance of examples where you had to use that particular skill. All right? So for whichever skills that are highlighted in the position description under the qualification section, you could pinpoint those and then provide that scenario. So then it's just easier for you to think through what your response might be. Okay. So that's kind of a quick snapshot of what we have to offer. Um, like I mentioned, the first step is to stop in during our walk-in hours. And those are Monday through Friday, 9.30 to 2.30. If you're not able to make it in to so walk-in hours, we do review resumes electronically. So we try to make it as convenient for you as possible, all right? Um, and then once you've gone to do that, you can meet with the career prep advisor. And we encourage you to come in to have your resume reviewed at least once a semester, especially if you're, you know, adding more experience each semester, um, and then just to have a second set of eyes to take a look at your resume. Okay. Are there any questions? Will I see each of you there? <laughs> well, before we uh, break for the cookies that I know you've all come for, mm -hmm. uh, we need to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you look in your packet uh, for one last um, item, you'll find a survey uh, about career night. Uh, and if you take a few minutes uh, to fill that um, out, uh, it helps us uh, plan this, these events uh, in the future and uh, helps us know what, what's been helpful and useful for you and, and uh, what, uh, what's not. Um, Maria supposedly has pens, but Maria's vanished um, uh, at the moment. But um, uh, let me um, conclude before we um, leave by asking you to uh, join me uh, in um, Thanking Maria for all the work that she has done uh, in this, in making this possible, uh, with a uh, vigorous round of uh, of applause. So thank you all for coming. Um, enjoy the uh, the refreshments. Uh, the speakers here will be around um, uh, informally to talk to you if you. Uh, have questions or uh, want uh, further information from them. So uh, thank you, and um, uh, go get the uh, the cookies after you've finished your uh, your forms. <laughs>